So we're continuing in the Gospel of John. Now that was a lot of scripture to read this morning. Okay? <laughs> um, we're going to kind of barrel through it, but I think we're going to do it in a way that's going to bring it to a very clear point. Because if you remember last week, I made the statement that after Jesus has this major confrontation with the religious leaders in the temple, he really unleashes his identity. He locates his authority and the authority of God and the witness of, of man from John the Baptist and the witness of Moses through the scriptures. That something really starts to take off in his ministry. And we see the challenges get more sharp with the religious leaders because they were set out to kill him. And we also see the numbers of people that come and follow him start to balloon. This story is a great example of this. Because somewhere in the 60 miles between Jerusalem and Galilee, how many people end up on the banks of the sea waiting to hear him talk? 5,000. Now get your head around that number for a second. That's a lot of people. That's a whole lot of people. And I think one of the interesting things is, um, and I'm not sure quite what to do with it if I'm being perfectly honest, is um, <laughs> Philip, instead of saying, wow, look at all these people come out to hear, hear the word, Philip says, how are we going to feed these folks? <laughs> so they must have been Methodists, the first thing they're thinking about is going to be them. And Jesus you know, says, well, don't worry about it. You know, he kind of tests them. And then all of a sudden, there's this great miracle where Jesus feeds the 5,000 with this really ministry of the amount of food. And so once their bellies are full, what do they do? Anybody ever see the movie Rudy? Yes. Where they're carrying him around on his shoulders and after the ball game and stuff like that. It's a Notre Dame player who uh, watch it. But it's one of those end of the end of the game point things where they're carrying him out on his shoulder and up on their shoulders. The team's chanting his name after the big game. And I guess that's where the crowds were. They wanted to take Jesus and make him their king. And Jesus. I think in that moment realized their heads were not in any place to hear anything he had to say. Because if you remember, what Jesus has been trying to drive home all this time is he's not a king as the world sees a king. He's a spiritual leader. He is someone who's breaking the kingdom of God into this world. He is the king of the kingdom of God, but that's very different than an earthly king. Jesus isn't looking for his power to be rooted in politics and that kind of an authority. Jesus' power is rooted in the Holy Spirit and the truth of God. And so when he realizes that their head is going totally the wrong direction, he slips away. He hides. Now it doesn't say how the people reacted to him hiding. It just says apparently some of them were hanging around. And that night, the disciples hop into a boat and head across the Sea of Galilee. Now, it doesn't really say why Jesus decided to go with them. But we talked about this in this story last summer, and a lot of people look at this and, and, and believe that John puts this incident here to make another reminder of if you, if you don't believe that multiplying the food is a sign of Jesus' divinity, you really can't get past a guy walking on the water. Nobody can do this except Christ except the Messiah, except the Holy One of God who has command over all things. And so Jesus reaffirms his identity as divine as he takes a stroll across the sea. And it must have been a long time, because it says they were three to four miles out to sea when Jesus comes trotting on past them. And they make it to the other side. Now, something significant happens here. The people get up, and they realize there was only one boat, that boat's gone. They knew Jesus didn't go with the disciples. We can assume they probably saw the disciples leave. Jesus wasn't with them. And yet none of them were there by the sea anymore. So they must, they assumed they must have gone across. So they waited for the shipping fleet to come in, whatever that looked like, and then they hopped on some boats, and they followed him across the sea. These events are very linked together. Jesus providing a massive buffet inspires them to the point that they really want to hear what's going on with him. And that is what takes us across the Sea of Galilee. And in the process, we are reminded again of Jesus' divinity. And when they get over there, how are they greeted by Jesus? Does he say, wow, 
you guys have really come a long way. It's your medicine. The only reason you're over here is because I gave you a really nifty lunch. He says, the only reason you're here is because I filled your bellies. You're missing the point of everything that I'm trying to give you. You're focused on the physical. There's something so much beyond this and I'm trying to get it through to you. And I think that a lot of times, I think this is a very you and me story. Because how many times is our faith rooted in when things are going our way? When, we, when everything is, is going right, it's very easy to live into our sense of faith and to claim Jesus Christ. But when things start to go a little bit wrong, it, it, our faith tends to waver. Our participation in our faith tends to waver. Let me ask you something. How many of you this morning when you woke up were tempted to not leave your air conditioner? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, that temptation, that's nothing. You know what I mean? It's not like you have to worry about walking out your door and getting hit by a bunch of marauders coming to, 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 to mow you while you're on your way to church. It's just something as simple as air conditioning. And that tempts us to hold back and pull back in our participation, in our faith, and in the community of faith. I'm not saying that as a, you know, Shame on you for, you know, that, and what I'm saying is that we are human and we have these things that draw us away from God. And many times our privilege can be at the root of what does that. Because we have the blessing in this country of being very comfortable, particularly relative to the rest of the world. And so Jesus is calling them out on this. Jesus is saying, look, your focus is on the physical things. Your focus is on what can you do for me, Jesus? How can you heal me? How can you feed me? What are you doing? What have you done for me lately kind of a thing? And he goes into this, this, uh, this discussion that we've heard him go into before, right? I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be thirsty again. Again, I am giving you food that brings life. The food that you're talking about, the manna from heaven, the stuff that you're eating and putting into your bodies, you can eat that as much as you want. You're still going to die. Depending on what you eat, it may, it may make you die quicker. But I'm talking about something that's so far beyond the physical. I'm talking about something that will bring you true life and true fulfillment. I'm talking to you about what will bring you eternal life and eternal joy and peace in the presence of God. This is what I want you to see. You're focusing on the, the lunch and you're focusing that I was able to skip across the water and that's all really cool. But that's not the core of what I'm trying to give you. And he keeps on talking about his blood and his flesh. Now, under a certain context, if you read some of the stuff I read, could it almost sound like we just entered into like a vampire movie? You must. That's, that's in my bed, right? <laughs> you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. <laughs> right? I mean, it has that tone to it if we that into it. But when we understand what he's saying, it's something far more profound. And when he gets into it, what happens to the Jewish leaders? Here's that confrontation and here's that conflict. The leaders start looking around and stirring people up and saying, what do you mean? What's he saying? we got to eat his flesh. That's disgusting. What are we going to serve him up by the pound and that's going to give us eternal life? How does that work? And they start sowing these seeds of confusion and discrediting while Jesus is trying to give this spiritual truth. Now, put yourself in that position. Have you ever been trying to communicate with somebody, somebody that you love, something very, very deep, something very meaningful, and then some other person comes in and takes what you said and spins it completely out of context? And you wind up getting in trouble? Or the person winds up with a massive misunderstanding? That's what's going on here. They're trying to throw a monkey wrench into the works here. And Jesus is continually just trying to say, no, you don't get it. I'm telling you. And, and we see, and this is a perfect message for communion. Because there's so much communion imagery in here. His flesh and his blood. You have to participate in my flesh, in my blood. In other words, everything that I'm giving to you. 
you, embrace it with all of who you are. Everything that I'm sharing with you, everything that you see me doing, the love and the mercy and the grace that I'm modeling, drink that in. Take that in. That is the essence of my flesh and my blood. And when you take that in, you become who God wants you to be. You become fulfilled. You get pulled away from the foolishness of the world and those things that tend to press in on you and make you feel unworthy or make you feel like you're not good enough or like or, 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 or depressed or whatever it is because you're not meeting the world's standards. You're unshackled from that because you have a new standard. The standard that comes from living in Jesus Christ. That's what he wants for them. But what happens? We have thousands of people come to stand. And we hear this. This teaching is too difficult for us. This teaching is too difficult for us. Now that could mean a couple of things. I think it, it could mean that maybe some of them were buying into the ridiculous spin that the, that the religious leaders were putting on to it. Which means they kind of got just really sucked away and probably weren't that invested to begin with. There might have been others who were looking and trying to make heads or tails out of it and say, you know what, this is, this is a little confusing and I just really don't feel like putting the time and energy and understanding it, so, you know, I'm just going to put off this. I think about, uh, any ever buy something from like Ikea or Walmart and it's assembly required and you get halfway through the assembly and then you burn it. <laughs> that same spirit. I don't want to put the work in to figure this out. Or maybe it's something even, even deeper where they do realize what Jesus is asking. Jesus is saying, they get that Jesus is asking them to fully commit to God. To fully turn themselves over to the spirit. And to fully embrace the life that Christ is offering them. But they don't want to do it. They want to hang on to what they have. It's part of like that expression Jesus says in another part of Scripture, He says, those who wish to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. They were hanging on too tight. And it says, many disciples went away. I don't know if this is the way it's intended, this is how I took it. By the end of that passage, out of 5,000 people that were there, how many were left? He says, He, he turned the 12. Well, 12 out of 5,000 were able to hang in there with the words of Christ. The rest of them, it's a problem. But Peter's response is so significant, I think. I don't want to misquote it. Do you wish to go away? Lord,
and spread a message of love and joy and peace and grace that is at the heart of a huge, huge percentage of the mission work and of the peace efforts that go on all around the world today. It started very, very pointedly in this moment where these guys said, no, I will walk, I will walk with you. I will buy into you. I will become and live into your flesh and into your blood. And that's what I want to call us to today. Because there is a the peace that comes from knowing the wrong point. The freedom that comes from forgiveness. The joy that comes from letting go and simply loving the world around us. And loving those that are in our company. The assurance that comes from knowing that we have put our stock and trust in the creator of all things. That we, that's a life that we lead that may look different than the world, but it is a life that is fulfilled and we go to bed every night without regret. And the people around us see something different. And then just as the disciples and Jesus Christ himself transformed the world 2,000 years ago, we continue that tradition of transformation by buying into and living into our faith. I'm going to allow this to lead us in the communion this morning. Because at the heart, at the heart of our communion message is that message of self-giving love and of sacrifice. It's that message that Jesus gave all for us. And that when we are called, when we, when we take the bread and when we take the cup and we realize what this symbolizes, we also realize that it is our call as well to live into that same self-giving to live into that same sacrifice, to live into that same willingness to stand up for what is good and right and godly no matter the cost. Because when we do that, just as when Jesus went to that cross, it was a free moment for all of humanity. When we do the same, there are those around us who hope it will be a free moment. And they're waiting for someone to step in the shoes of Jesus Christ in that moment and take a stand for what is good. And I believe you as I, I look around, I believe that we have a congregation filled with people who are called into that moment, who have the heart to live into that moment. And so today, we take a moment and pause and we remember. Christ taking the bread and lifting it to heaven and giving thanks. This is my body broken for you. And in like fashion, he lifts the cup to heaven and says, This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Take and eat, take and drink. As often as you do this, remember me. I want to remind us of something profound today. If you listen to that scripture about the feeding of 5,000 in that situation, it's all about the body and the blood. But what did Jesus do with the bread? He multiplied it. As we come today, I want to encourage us, as we take communion, to allow Jesus to multiply what is represented here in us. Let the bread be the bread of life. Multiply and spread to the world through us. Let the blood that represents forgiveness and sacrifice dwell within us and be multiplied to the world. Thank you.